here are the assumptions. When I say permissionless implementation, I want to be very clear about what I'm assuming so that we all know what I'm talking about here. So I'm saying one assumption is that any smart contract can get in, at least at some point. It can stay hidden for a while and then pop out or something later. And then people might want to try to get rid of it, but after a point of no return of some kind. The reverse of this assumption is this entire talk's thesis. So if you, if all I want is for this to be false, so I'm assuming it's true to highlight how dangerous it is. And here I just kind of point out that it's kind of hard if miners try to censor on a contract by contract basis. I'll get more into detail on how it's easier for them to censor something, an infrequent large thing, for example, like a soft fork event. In particular, this is a blog post by Vitalik about censorship on the Ethereum blog, and they have, they have some, they claim to have some kind of solution for this. It's not important. I'm just saying that this is the Ethereum ethos that you should, you should be able to. The miners should not be able to prevent individual contracts from being added to the system, which is exactly what I argue is incorrect. Which is exactly what I argue is inefficient. And then the second major assumption is that the smart contracts are allowed to themselves be at or near the complexity of Bitcoin. Again, this is Vitalik, who has apparently implemented counterparty in 340 lines of Serpent, which is their Python code. So I don't, it would appear to be that these are fair game. So here's example number one of how permissionless implementation is bad. In other words, how there's sort of a, a more is less problem. Here's Gavin Andreessen on Ethereum blogging in 2014, a long time ago. And he's saying all of the really interesting complex contracts that I can think of require data from outside the blockchain. Like the Bitcoin USD exchange rate on some future date for blockchain enforced futures contracts. So when I say data from outside the blockchain. I use the word Oracle to describe this. The word Oracle means a lot of things. We're not in the Bank of Google situation. So, so the, the deal is, if you have permissionless implementation, it, you've, you've exposed the entire system to a reputation-free rider problem. You've got a, you've, someone has created a resource which is going to be exploited by a parasitic contract. If the Oracle doesn't control anything valuable, this conversation is over. But we care about when the Oracle is going to be in a decentralized place and try to provide data from outside which is valuable. And in this case, which is the important case, the Oracle is going to incur an opportunity cost of theft. They could make money by stealing from you, and so they're going to need a reason not to steal, which is going to be a big problem. Here's one slide about the basics of Oracles. Um, oracles need to vary in quality. It's an absolute requirement. So first you choose an oracle. Here this guy has chosen this blue guy out of three potential oracles. And then there'll be something that happens in step two where the oracle reports on something. This is the report. And only after that takes place can you move on to step three where you evaluate whether or not the real thing matched what the oracle reported. So mid-event, you necessarily trust them because this only makes this entire operation only makes sense if you choose them before the event takes place because there's no contention after the event takes place. So you have to choose them first, and then you have to trust them, and only after the event to, and the report take place can you evaluate whether or not the event matched the report because you need both of those things to do an evaluation. So since there's no way of guaranteeing performance, these these oracles necessarily have the freedom to vary in quality. They might coincidentally all be honest all the time, but there's no compulsion of that. There's no magical uh, reason for that to happen. So here, I'm just saying, logically, the oracles must have the freedom to vary in quality. Unless you have some magical way of always getting accurate, always getting perfect oracles, in which case, feel free to share it with the rest of the planet. Uh, OK, so here is the entire problem in one slide. As I've just explained, necessarily the oracles will vary in quality. It's absolutely necessary. Now the oracle has to charge at a very min at the very least. They have to charge enough to make up for their costs. Here I have all their costs. The oracle fee, which you have to pay up front, back here in step one, 
What are necessarily the components of this fee? Just the costs alone. Only the costs. Well, first of all, you have to pay a tiny setup cost. You only have to, you know, these people have to kind of find out about this project and decide to use their spare, scarce time and kind of looking into this and getting set up. And then they have to pay for their labor. They have to actually research what the event was and you know what the outcome was and how to format their answer and they have to go through with it, blah, blah, blah. The big thing is that they have a quality premium. The higher the quality is, the more they need to charge because all honesty is costly to the Oracle. The Oracle foregoes opportunities to steal money. So if they're not getting it from you, they need to get it from somewhere. If you don't compensate for this, they'll just steal from you. It's very simple. Again, it's, I think it's, I mean, I hope it's simple. I hope it's clear. These, this is what must be charged by every Oracle. It's a, this is like ironclad mathematics. This is inescapable. So what's the problem? Yeah, the problem is that this red guy over here shows up. He's permissionless implementation. He shows up and what he says is he's going to copy blue when blue reports. And this guy is always cheaper than blue. He loses, most importantly of all, he loses the quality premium. He can copy anyone regardless of what their quality is. He can copy anyone regardless of what their quality is. I'm, I'm going to repeat that. But in addition, he also has a detail. He doesn't have to pay for labor. He just has to set this up. Maybe his setup is more complicated. It doesn't really matter. So he's always cheaper. His fee is always smaller than this fee up here. It's a bigger fee. So he's always cheaper. And he's always exactly as reliable. Now, why is that the case? Because the information that's on a blockchain now is non-excludable. You can't stop someone from using this. Once Blue puts it on the blockchain, you it's there for everyone to use. So once this guy is here on the blockchain, he's on the blockchain. He's a sitting duck. So what Red's contract does is it just it's a function of what he finds this guy's report. And he may find the report just by betting with a tiny amount with blue or something. Or he might pool up or so he can do this in any number of ways. All of them are easy and all of them work perfectly. And he just copies what this guy's report is. So again, he's always exactly as reliable. But the problem is that the, while the quality must be free to vary, the payments don't co-vary with that quality. They're always just on some low amount. So as a result, in this ecosystem, it is impossible to buy quality. The quality dimension does not exist. And so the concept of a high quality oracle is impossible. It's just impossible. It can't be done. But not in a sustainable sense. So it can be done in an experimental phase, but it cannot be done at scale. So as a result, all crypto reputation is impossible because you can't buy it. You can't use the reputation for anything because all you can do is copy the most reputable person. As a result of that, all DAX, distributed autonomous corporations, so to speak, are impossible because you can just copy. This is the classic problem of how do you force someone to use, how do you force someone to use like the app coin? But it's just kind of taken to the reputation dimension. So all this stuff, uh, distributed autonomous corporation, you know, anything that related to identity, because again, you could just copy the person's identity. So it depends on a little bit on how the identity is used, but in general, most of this is all impossible. Financial markets, impossible. It's all impossible in the blockchain sense. But in contrast to this, if you have one single mega contract, then as long as you exclude entrance, the mega contract can coordinate payment events and Oracle quality events. So it can force a mapping from payments to quality, which is what's absolutely required. Again, I agree with Gavin. All of the really interesting contracts require this. So it's not just like a tiny detail that oracles don't work. It's it, There's really no point in doing a project. There's no point in having side chains, in my view, if we can't get this kind of thing. It's kind of a big loss.